Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my home in Savannah, Georgia. I'm Juliet Gordon Lowe. But won't you call me Daisy? Daisy is the nickname I've had ever since I was a child, and it's what my friends call me, so I do hope that you will too call me Daisy. Now I heard that you have come here to learn about my history of the Girl Scouts and how it all started. And perhaps you'd like to know a little bit about my life. But I also want to know about you. So with those typing skills that I'm sure many of our scouts out there have, I would love to know where you come from. And perhaps you'd like to tell me your name or what troop you belong to. Now, I am going to take many questions during today's session. So if you already have a question for me, what you need to do is type question and then your question. And my helper, Miss Marie, hello, Miss Marie. <laughs> She's going to help me answer your questions today. But I suppose I should start from the very beginning. Now, I was born here in Savannah on October 31st of 1860. Yes, Halloween night. I'm sure some of you already knew that as we do celebrate my birthday in the Girl Scouts every year. You might also know that I tend to stand on my head on my birthday. <laughs> now I am getting a little bit up in age, so standing on my head gets a little harder each year, but Girl Scouting has certainly kept me young. And you know, it feels as though I have always been a scout, except I didn't quite know it when I was so young. I always enjoyed nature and playing athletics, such as a basketball. Tennis was one of my favorite sports as well, but I also loved the arts. I loved to draw and especially paint. I became very well known for my sculpture ability as well. I love to write. I even wrote my own plays for my five other siblings and many of my cousins to perform on our family outings. Did you know that I would always make myself the star? <laughs> so I've always been interested in just so many things. I didn't know where life was going to take me, but I'm very glad that my path led to the Girl Scouts. Oh, and what a journey it has been. I never expected this in all my years, especially because a woman of my time was expected to take a certain path in life. Of course, she was expected to become a devoted wife and a loving mother to a big family. But I soon learned that that was not the path for me. I did marry, but I did not have a very happy marriage, and I learned that I could not have children of my own. Therefore, I felt so lost in my younger years as a young woman. I didn't have much guidance when I felt that sense of loss and didn't quite know where my life was going to end up. Now, I didn't just sit around and mope all the time. I put myself to work. I took art lessons with famous artists. I even learned how to blacksmith, which is quite unusual for a woman of my time. Woodworking as well. I've traveled the world. And in large part, that is because I am a woman of some means. I'm very lucky. I'm fortunate to have the wealth that I do. And I believe that if you do have that fortunate wealth in your life, Yes, you can take pleasures in the world by traveling to different cult cultures and different countries, but you should also use that fortunate part of your life for the good of others. And that is what I always strove to do, and it's what I found Girl Scouts is really all about, helping others. Now, of course, we do all sorts of fun activities as Girl Scouts. We learn skills of survival and self-sufficiency. We learn about how to observe nature and identify plants and animals. We go camping quite a bit, hiking as well. We learn valuable skills in first aid as well, much of which we learn from the Red Cross. 
and we have been quite a big help in even large events in our nation's history. Uh, for instance, during what we call the Great War, which you may know as World War I, Girl Scouts were front and center, ready to help. Why, we even were awarded by Mr. Hoover himself for our thrift program. We helped young women who were here on the home front learn how to conserve their food, take good care of themselves and their children while their husbands were away fighting for the war. Now, I must tell you, not everyone thought that Girl Scouts ought to be Girl Scouts. They didn't think that girls were supposed to do these types of activities that Boy Scouts were doing. Well, our mission, in part, was to prove them wrong by doing our duty and helping the community that we were in all over the nation. Now, of course, we started quite small, but you may wonder, how did it all begin in the first place? Well, for that, I have my good friend BP to thank. Now, that's Sir Robert Baden Pohl. Now, he is the founder of Boy Scouts, and I just so happened to be at the same banquet as he. It was in England in 1911, and I had heard so much about Sir Robert Baden Pohl, as he was a very famous war hero of a, a, a war in South Africa called the Boer War. And after his fame, he soon had a scouting manual for young men and young boys to learn skills of the trade of being a scout in the military. Well, this took off like wildfire, and it wasn't only boys who were interested. Over 6,000 girls registered to be Boy Scouts, some using initials, some using their brother's names, and some simply saying, please sign me up. Well, after that, BP had a good idea, and he made an organization with his sister Agnes, a wonderful woman and a great leader, called Girl Guides. This was sort of a, a sister organization to the Boy Scouts. And I immediately was enthralled. I was thrilled to find an organization that I could help in that would help youngsters become confident in themselves, learn valuable skills, be a help to their community. Why, it really was everything I wish I had as a child. So, while I was in England and in Scotland, I formed groups of girl guides there, learning all the skills that I needed, and took that idea with BP's support and permission to the United States. And on March 12th, 1912, we started our first group of girl guides, <laughs> but it wasn't long after that my girls insisted that they ought to be called scouts, and I agreed. So, in 1915, we became the Girl Scouts. It all started here at my home in Savannah. We would march and drill in my backyard. We would play basketball. We would have tea with one another, talk about each other's days and support one another through any troubles we might have. And I must say, all those years that I felt that I would never have a family, well, can I tell you something? As of today in 1920, we have over 82,000 Girl Scouts registered. And I do feel that each and every one of them is like a daughter to me. Each and every one of you, my Scouts, you are like a daughter to me, and I am so very proud of you. Now, I'm going on as usual. I would love to answer any of your questions. There's plenty to talk about. So if you have a question, you may type your question, and Miss Marie will assist me with asking your question for you, and then I'll answer as best as I can. Hello, this is Marie from Behind the Scenes, and our first question for you today is, can you talk about some of your friends, specifically the Jewish friends who helped you found your troop? Oh, yes, thank you so much. Well, I've made many friends along the way, and you're right. There have been people from all sorts of different cultures that have become scouts and believed in the scouting mission. Now, my longest friends are Abby and Mary. 
Now, Abby and I, uh, and Mary, we met in boarding school. Now, boarding school, if you're not aware, that's the type of schooling that I received as a young lady. And it was far from home, first in Virginia and then in New York, which was very exciting, but I also dearly missed my home of Savannah. So when I met Mary and Abby, well, I was just so overjoyed to have friends who I really connected with. We would play games together, we had classes together, we would travel around town together, and we even had our own secret society together, which it almost seems like foreshadowing. We even had badges in that secret society. So Abby and Mary, we've been friends for a very, very long time, and I still correspond with them to this day. They are like sisters to me. Now, I've met many friends along the way, and many of our supporters, and even my own staff, have become close friends of mine. Uh, Jane Rippon, in particular, she has been invaluable to the organization, especially now as we are growing so much. Jane offers skills that, well, I simply don't have. I would call myself more of a, a visionary, but when it comes to organization, well, that's not my strong suit. So I'm very happy to have friends and staff like Jane Rippon, as well as Helen Storo. Now, Helen in particular was a very good friend to me, and I'll tell you why. She told me something that was hard to say. I told you I'm not very good with organization, and I always have ideas that I want to start immediately, because when you have an idea, it's just so exciting, and you want to start immediately, but Helen was a bit more uh, pragmatic. She knew how to set the stage for a well-organized uh, opening of a new idea, so to speak, and Helen saw that there were times when I was getting in the way of the organization part with my big ideas and wanting to jump at the chance to start all of them. Helen took me aside and she told me that I needed to trust the staff. I needed to trust the fine women that I had hired and the fine women across this country now as the organization had outgrown my soul care, you could say. It's, it's almost like when you have a child and they've grown up and you fear for them as they go out there on their own, but at the same time, you have to trust them because you're the one who brought them up. You taught them the skills they need to be independent. And here in 1920, the Girl Scouts with 82,000 girls, well, it has outgrown my soul uh, leadership. Now, of course, I still have many ideas to share with the girls. I keep a, a careful eye on all of our Girl Scouts and the goings on, but it takes a good friend to tell you what you might not want to hear. <laughs> and speaking of hearing, I know that some of you are aware that I do have a, a hearing deficiency. I am very hard of hearing at times. And there's one lesson that I've learned from that. Sometimes it's that I never have to hear the word no. But there's also another lesson, to truly listen. It doesn't take good hearing to truly listen when other people are trying to help you. So Helen was one of those very good friends. Now, I was also friends with, of course, Sir Robert baden Pole, as well as a, a fine author named Rudyard Kipling. H him and his wife, Rudyard and Caroline, they're very famous, and Rudyard is known for his book, The Jungle Book, which if you have not had an opportunity to read The Jungle Book, I highly recommend it. I thank you for your question. And as you do ask your questions, I would love to know uh, what your name is so I can address you directly. I'd love to take another question, Miss Marie. Oh, girl. Go back to your correspondence is coming in. <laughs> so what is one of your favorite things to teach the scouts? Oh, there are many lessons that we learn as scouts. And there are many skills that we learn as scouts, but I feel that the most valuable thing a scout can learn is to be a good and kind supporter of their community, to be a good citizen 
means knowing the issues in your own community and trying to solve those issues. Now, of course, for many of our Girl Scouts, we help uh, the those who are impoverished, those who are in the poorer classes of our society, who do not have as much money or resources. We are very valuable to them. And of course, I feel that kindness is, a, is at the center of being a Girl Scout. Everything really begins there. Being kind to your friends, your family, your neighbors. Now, I, taught, I learned this uh, from my own mother. And it was uh, in my earliest days. I, I was only a child during this time, but in my earliest memories, I actually was living through a war, the Civil War in Savannah, Georgia. And at this time, my earliest memories were of my mother being kind and supporting and giving to those who did not have as much as we did and were in a worse position due to the war. You see, supplies like food and clothing were not as available during the war. So I saw my own mother giving to our neighbors who did not have as much. And that has always stuck with me. Now, my mother, she is a fearsome woman and she is very much like myself and wanted to be of service in this world. And I truly believe that she taught me that. Uh, first. And Girl Scouts has shown me so many other ways in which we can be kind to one another, kind to the nature around us by learning about all of creation. And so I feel that Girl Scouts ought to, at the very least, be kind. I appreciate your question. Thank you for that. <laughs> Donna would like to know if you can tell us a little bit about your pets. Oh, my pets, Donna. No, it's Donna, correct? Uh, so you'll have to forgive me. I, I am hard of hearing. Donna, I have many pets indeed. That's one of the things that I'm quite well known for, especially at Wellsburn House in Scotland. Now, my pets, I am quite fond of the breed of Pekingese dogs, and uh, I, I find them so, so adorable, and they're so friendly and cute and small, of course. And one of my favorite Pekingese, well, his name was Stink Pot Navy Boy. <laughs> now, there's a, uh, you can tell that I have quite a sense of humor to call my dog Stink Pot Navy Boy, and I get a kick every time that we call him. Now, there was also Seal, my other Pekingese dog, very sweet, sweet dog. I also had uh, quite a few horses at Wellsburn House, as my husband, William Lowe, was very fond of horses, and I am too. I also, ah, uh, yes, my Georgia Mockingbirds. When I went to Scotland with my husband at our home there called Wellsburn House, we brought along two Georgia Mockingbirds, and I was so happy to have them as it reminded me of the sounds of Savannah and home. Now, uh, speaking of birds, I also had a beautiful blue macaw. Now, this is a very large parrot, and his name was Blue Boy, and I still have him, as parrots live quite a long time, you should know, before you get yourself one. <laughs> So I've had many pets along the way. Uh, we also had a, a cat growing up, uh, and there's hunting dogs as well, as my husband and I am as well very fond of hunting, so we have many hounds as well. Uh, thank you, Donna, for your question. I love talking about all my pets. <laughs> Emily would like to know if you feel embarrassed about being born on Halloween. Oh, Emily. <laughs> embarrassed? You know, not so much. Uh, yeah, the most embarrassing part about it is when everybody makes a fuss about your birthday. Now, as much as I have a very, uh, some might say, uh, an electrifying personality, as it's been explained to me before, I don't actually enjoy being the center of attention all that much. So when it's my birthday, I would much rather host the party than be the center of attention. Now, of course, on Halloween, there are many festive things that you get to do, especially with costumes. I remember one of my favorite costumes was, uh, I'll tell you the story. Now, I was not feeling very well and I thought for sure I was not going to make it to the party since I was just, I was just simply tired. But when I heard everybody's laughter and the music playing, I, 
I got my spirits up, so to speak, and that gave me an idea. Uh, because I didn't have a costume in hand as I didn't know I was to attend the party. So I took a blank white sheet, cut two holes, and made myself uh, a ghost-like figure. But that wasn't all. I took empty bottles of uh, different alcohols and attached them to my costume and went as departed spirits. <laughs> Now, for our younger children, another word for uh, those types of alcohols is spirits. So, with those empty bottles, those spirits had been departed. <laughs> I appreciate your, your question. I, I do enjoy my birthday, and of course many of you may know that it has been a long tradition of mine that I stand on my head on my birthday. So, uh, perhaps when we come around to October, you might get a chance to see that as well. <laughs> I appreciate your question. Amy would like to know, what is your favorite thing to teach the Scouts? Well, we did discuss uh, kindness, of course, and I feel that that's very valuable, but something that I love to teach my girls is to pursue other careers and to think about the types of careers they might enjoy. Now, I am particularly fascinated by aviation. so. I encourage my girls to learn about flying airplanes and what's called aerodynamics. And I encourage them to think about possibly becoming pilots when they get a bit older. Uh, other career choices that I encourage are architecture, so that's designing buildings and houses, as well as uh, translation, learning other languages so that you can become a translator. Now, of course, there are also very important jobs, such as nursing and secretarial work, but I want my girls to know that there is a big, wide world out there for the taking, and there are so many paths that they can take, which is why we like to give our girls a well-rounded education, not only in survival skills and camping skills, but so that they are, of course, you're always a Girl Scout, but when you do graduate from Girl Scouts, you are able to choose a career that fulfills you. You know, for years, uh, when I was in my 20s and not quite sure where my path was going to lead me, I, I did consider that I might become a professional artist. But I, I, now I still get to enjoy art, but also lead this fine organization, which truly gives me fulfillment that I don't think I could find anywhere else. I appreciate your question. Thank you. <clears throat> Julia would like to know, what were the first badges like? Oh, Julia, the first badges. Yes, well, we did have a fairly well-rounded curriculum that was based on girl guiding. Now, you call, call to mind that I did work as a girl guide in Scotland and England. But when we took uh, girl guiding to the United States, we had some changes to the curriculum. We wanted to ensure that our girl scouts were indeed going to be scouts. So we, uh, we included more scouting badges, those like for uh, nature study, for example. But there are also badges for artistic skills, such as drawing, painting, illustration, there was also nursing badges, and these badges, they were round, uh, usually, and tan uh, with black thread. Now, this tan color, it comes from the military. Uh, in the beginning, many of our, uh, the girl guides wore blue suits, but when we became scouts, we wanted to look the part of a scout, and tan has always been, that khaki tan has always been the uniform of the scouts, so we took up that. And as you can see, I have my, my troop leader jacket on today of this nice no Norfolk jacket design. And you can see that it is that military tan. So the badges would have been the same color with usually black thread and a symbol to represent the skill that was earned. I thank you for your question. Susan would like to know if you can tell us the story about how you sold your pearls to pay for rent. Oh, my pearls. <laughs> that is quite a story. Now, of course, I told you that I am a woman of some means, and I've been very fortunate. I, I, 
Even as a child, I, I wanted for nothing, and I, I do think about that quite often, as I know there are so many people that go without so much. So when we were starting the Girl Scouts, it was entirely funded by me. <laughs> it wasn't until much later, and now as I am in 1920, that we decided on ways uh, through registration dues and, and selling our Girl Scouts manual to raise funds for the Girl Scouts, but in the beginning, it was all my financing. So there came a time, especially as I I did not have the best uh, financial organization skills either, that I did have to consider selling one of my most valuable uh, pieces of jewelry, and that was a beautiful set of pearls that I did treasure, but you know, now that those pearls are gone, and I ha was able to continue the Girl Scouts because I sold those pearls to fund the Girl Scouts, and I tell you, it's hardly a day now that I even think of those pearls. <laughs> it was a good lesson for me. Sometimes we do need to let go or weigh our options, don't we, to see what is the best, best path forward, what is going to do the most good. And in that situation, though hard in the beginning when I had to lose those beautiful, beautiful pearls, I knew that I was making the right decision because it would mean continuing Girl Scouts, and that was far greater of importance to me than any old pearls. I thank you for your question. <laughs> Lori would like to know, how old were you when you founded the Scouts? Ah, uh, how old was I? Well, I founded the Scouts a bit later in my life. Now, this was 1912, so I was already in my 50s. So it was something that I'd never quite expected so late in my life. But at the same time, I felt that I wasn't the, a woman who was going to, uh, to find a career at that time, lest it be uh, artwork or be known for my art at least. And I could have gone on as a, a woman who is simply a, a, a homemaker, and not that, that is a, that's a very important job itself, but I felt that without a family to make a home for, and an unhappy marriage, I needed to find something for myself. And I was so fortunate that, truly out of sheer luck, that I happened to be at that banquet where Robert Baden Pohl was, and he was the one who really encouraged me to learn more about scouting and to become a girl guide leader. And I am always going to be thankful for him for that, as he has been a great supporter of me and the Girl Scout movement. So I did not expect to find an entirely new path for myself so late in life, but oh boy, am I sure glad I did. I thank you for your question, Lori. Robin would like to know, what is your favorite piece of art that you've made? Oh, my favorite piece of art that I've made. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is a small sculpture that I made of my dear uh, little niece. Uh, we call her Daisy Dukes. <laughs> she, she also shares that nickname. And it's the sculpture is of her as a young girl, and there's even a little turtle by her. And she's relaxing, uh, I like to think, in the grass among nature. And there's a certain innocence that I was trying to evoke in that sculpture as Daisy, you, you might know, was officially our very first girl guide and girl scout as she registered. And so she's always been very important to me. So to create a sculpture that truly shows a, a young girl appreciating nature and being one with nature, I thoroughly enjoyed creating that sculpture and it's very dear to me. Now, other works of art that I have created, I was particularly fond of landscape, so there would be t uh, landscape paintings that I would uh, be very fond of, and I would also, uh, ceramic plates, that was also something I, I found quite entertaining. Uh, woodworking was also uh, a fascination of mine for a time, as I had met a, a, a woman who was a woodworker near Wellsburn House in Scotland, as she was actually the wife of the vicar in town, 
And it was very unusual for a woman to be a woodworker, and she showed me the skills of woodworking. So I was able to make quite a few little wood sculptures, as well as even the, uh, the, the foot feet of my own bed. <laughs> so art has always been something that I have connected with. You know, my, my, my mind is always buzzing with ideas, but when I am able to sit down and look at a painting, look at nature, and truly become connected with it, I feel calmest in those moments. So art has always been a way for me to relax, appreciate nature, to breathe, to pause, and I, am, I will always enjoy art. I appreciate your question. Thank you very much. Kesha was wondering if you could tell us about how you lost your hearing. Oh, Kesha, I, you're a dear for asking that. Yes. Well, as a child, I always had chronic ear infections. And of course, in, in my time so far, even from my younger days to now, the ear is not quite well known. Everything's very experimental. And sometimes those experiments do not have good outcomes. So, as a child, I had chronic ear infections, which did cause some scarring, as I understand it. And later in my life, I did pursue an experimental treatment on one of my worst ear, and this was with a silver nitrate. And unfortunately, that did not go very well, and I ended up losing even more of my hearing in that ear. Now, the time that is certainly uh, most detrimental to my hearing was a it was a very bizarre accident on all days. It was my wedding day. As Willie and I were leaving the chapel and our guests were throwing the celebration rice, one of those grains of rice landed in my ear and lodged itself so far in that I had to have surgery to remove it. Now this was not a welcome event for the beginning of my new marriage and especially my honeymoon, which I was supposed to enjoy. So I ended up getting the surgery, and unfortunately, the surgery caused further damage to my ear. And that surgery, in those times right after I got married, having to deal with sudden hearing loss and the sick feeling, of course, after you come out from a surgery, well, it was a very lonely time for myself. I was newly married, I was in Scotland, and I did find myself uh, quite alone for a very long time as uh, Willie was fond of gambling at the horse races and hunting. So it was a time where I wasn't quite sure why, why was this happening to me? Why, why me pitying myself all the while? But soon enough, I got itching to do something, and I did end up recovering well enough, but still uh, not hearing well really at all. And I got to working with uh, working girls in Scotland and found myself to be of some service there, and that's really what lifted me up from those challenges. We're all going to face challenges in our time, and sometimes the challenges that you never saw coming. but. There are also things in your life that you'll never see coming that are simply wonderful. And that was what Girl Scouts was for me. So I have had to persevere through my uh, hearing deficiencies, but it's also led to some interesting situations. <laughs> and I feel that people have uh, certainly gotten a kick out of uh, the situations I put myself in due to my hearing loss. I'll, I'll tell you a few. Now, it was our, our first national convention of the Girl Scouts of all times. And I noticed that uh, as we were at the banquet, uh, people rose to give a standing ovation and uh, I didn't want to be rude, so I stood up as well and applauded vigorously and then found out that they were applauding me and I didn't hear it. So here I was applauding myself to my heart's delight. <laughs> oh goodness, and another occasion. I'm very fond of fishing. And we were out on a fishing excursion uh, from a party and I insisted that we all go fishing. All these folks in their tuxedos and their, some of the women uh, came along in their ball gowns. And as we were fishing, I threw the line a great distance and I got it. 
Well, I thought I did. As I reeled in the fishing line, it wasn't until a few painful seconds later that I learned I had caught the ear of one of our guests at the party. Oh, I've gotten myself into some silly situations due to this hearing condition, but I have to tell you, people have grown quite fond of me because I persevere through it. I still am quite sociable and love to talk, especially to folks about the Girl Scouts. And in some situations, it has come to my benefit. <laughs> I mentioned this a little bit earlier. One of my, When I had to leave the Girl Guides in Scotland and I had to leave the girls to be led by someone else as I was going to start girl guiding in Savannah, Georgia. Well, the one woman that I thought would be an excellent leader, she was a bit nervous at first. I went up to her and uh, asked her that asked her to be the new troop leader. And well, can I tell you something? I knew that she was declining. No, 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 I simply couldn't. But but because of my hearing loss, I used that to my advantage, and I pretended that she had agreed to it and said, well then, it's all set. You'll have the tea ready for them next week. And she became their leader. <laughs> Sometimes it just takes a little prodding and pushing for some folks to agree to what is ultimately going to be a very good decision, at least in my opinion. And I think she would agree to this day. <laughs> so. My hearing loss, it has been a challenge for me. And there have been some new technologies that have helped me. Uh, one hearing aid is called an acousticon. And this acousticon, it amplifies the noises around you. So there's a little box that attaches to a speaker and you hold that speaker up to who you are listening to. And then there's a little uh, a disc that you put on your ear, and that's where you hear the sound. So if I were attending an occasion where there would be lots of uh, noise and it would be difficult to understand, folks, I would take my acousticon, and that would help a, a great deal. Now, can I tell you something? When I traveled to Egypt, I found that the weather made my hearing uh, loss almost completely disappear. So my hearing was also dependent on the weather. Scotland at Wellsburn House had a very different climate, so I wasn't very, uh, I couldn't hear quite well there, but I was amazed that the, pl the climate in Egypt allowed me to hear so much better. So that was one of my, my favorite vacations, uh, in part because of that. I thank you so much. Uh, Keisha, was it? Thank you, Keisha. Margo would like to know, what is your favorite song to sing? Oh, well, we have many uh, songs that we do sing around the campfire. And I would say that the one song that we tend to sing is around the campfire is our song about friendship, uh, a circle of friendship. And uh, one, uh, it goes a little bit like this when you're speaking about your friends, that one is silver, the other's gold. And you keep the new friends and keep the old. <laughs> so I feel that that's something that I love to sing to my Girl Scouts, especially our newer Girl Scouts, because it is so important to, while we're all going to go on different paths throughout this life, especially our fellow Girl Scouts are always going to be good friends. Those who are the silver, <laughs> the older friends, and those who are the new, the, the gold friends, so to speak. So that is a song that I do thoroughly enjoy. Now we also sing patriotic songs as part of the Girl Scouts. So we learn our national anthem and other patriotic songs. So there are quite a few songs that we enjoy singing. And sometimes the girls themselves will introduce a song to the troupe that I don't even know about. So when we sing, it is one of the more joyful occasions uh, around the campfire, especially. Oh, thank you for your question. Ida Marie was wondering, what was your annual fundraiser during those early scouting days? Oh, well, if only I had the idea of having an annual fundraiser event in the very beginning. I felt that, well, with my uh, wealth that I did have, it was upon me to finance the Girl Scouts in the very early days. 
Now, of course, <laughs> you heard my story about the pearls. That did have to change as we became a larger and larger organization. So as I stand here in 1920, uh, in fact, I recently heard of a very clever uh, Girl Scout troop. I believe it was the Mistletoe Troop in uh, Minnesota, perhaps, or perhaps it was Missouri. But they had a very successful bake sale with shortbread cookies. And I can't help but think that is an excellent fundraising model. Perhaps we'll pursue that a bit further. In fact, in our magazine, The Rally, uh, we have even placed a shortbread cookie uh, uh, recipe in the magazine so that other girls can take that idea and raise funds for their own troop. Now, other ways that we we do uh, fund the Girl Scouts are through registration dues, of course, and buying the manual. And of course, we also now manufacture our Girl Scout uniforms. But there are other fundraising ideas we've had, and some of them are not very successful, I must say. <laughs> there was one, I, you know my ideas. I want to try anything that leaps into my head. And something that's become uh, quite fashionable recently here in the 20s is uh, wrestling. Now, now, this is a different kind of wrestling. It's far more showy. And so I thought perhaps it would be a very good idea to host a fundraiser that was a wrestling match. Well, it didn't go the way that we intended, and we ended up losing money. But it was a valuable lesson nonetheless, and I am glad that we have all sorts of ideas to promote the Girl Scouts. Now, my most fantastic fundraising idea uh, that we actually put forward was uh, through our many parades. And one time, we not too long ago, we had a parade in New York City, and I was flying in an airplane high above New York City, and as I was flying, I was dropping Girl Scout pamphlets to those who were below so that we could spread the word about Girl Scouts and therefore gain more supporters. Now, there are uh, very valuable supporters to our organization, those who are philanthropists. That's those people who, like myself, have a fair amount of wealth and wish to do some good with it. So we are able to gain uh, financial support from ph philanthropists as well. But I do wish I had uh, thought of more ingenious ways for fundraising in the early days, but we just had no idea that scouting would grow so quickly. <laughs> so it's very good that I had my wonderful staff, especially Edith Johnston in the beginning, in order to help me figure out the organizational skills, the fundraising skills, and recruitment skills. I, I, I do uh, thank all of my staff for those uh, skills that I simply haven't always had. <laughs> I thank you for your question. Nayeli was wondering if you could tell us about what brownie badges looked like and also what was the first badge that you earned? Oh, Naomi. So, our brownie badges are going to look uh, similar to our Girl Scouting badges. They are going to still have that tan color to them as the base and then the emblem or the symbol would be usually in a black thread. So, even brownies, as they are our younger scouts, they're still earning those skills. And of course, we also, our younger scouts are called uh, tenderfoots as well. So uh, those, now the first, you, you asked the first badge that I had earned. <laughs> well, I guess it goes back to girl guiding. And the one skill that I surely had strength in from the very beginning was art. Now, I can't quite recall, as I did not earn badges as a troop leader, I, I, those were for the guides and the scouts themselves, but I have a feeling that if I were to earn my very first badge, uh, it would have been in the arts, as that was the skill that I could already bring uh, to the girls in the very beginning. Many of these skills I have had to learn with my girls, and that's been a very exciting part of it. But now it's been, oh, it's been five years since we've been Girl Scouts and eight years since we were Girl Guides. I've become quite familiar with our manual, of course, having written most of it. And so it has given me a great pride to have uh, all of those skills in my wheelhouse as well. Now I'll tell you, my absolute favorite badge is a little bit different than the rest of our badges. You earn it in a different way. 
And that is our thanks badge. Now a thanks badge, this is a badge that you are going to give to someone who you want to thank for doing something kind for you, or perhaps something that you really admire about them. And thanks badges are very special. And you give them in rare circumstances because you want it to mean something very, very special. So there have been moments when I have given thanks badges, including to uh, first ladies that are our honorary presidents as well of the Girl Scouts. So I make sure to give them a thanks badge for all of the support that they offer us. Thank you so much. Was that uh, Naomi or? Oh, Naeli. Thank you so much, Naeli. Anne was wondering if you could tell us about the founding of Camp Juliet Low in 1922 in Cowdland, Georgia. Oh, now, uh, now I am, it, it's 1920 for me here in Savannah, but we are discussing the idea of camps. And our first camp, well, we called it Camp Lowlands, sort of a play on words with my last name being Low. And of course, it was in the Lowland area of Savannah, Georgia. And this camp was, uh, it was a thrilling time for me because it was when my girls and I could finally put our skills to the test. Now, of course, in the beginning, when we would learn about our camping skills and hiking skills and nature observance, we would go to areas that were not too far from the city as we were all learning together and we didn't want to be far from a doctor. But as scouting grew, we did finally create our own camp at Camp Lowlands. And when you're at camp, you learn all types of different skills and you have activities throughout the day. Now our schedule, we would rise around 6.30 a.m. or so, and then we would have our breakfast, we would do our drills, and we would learn a specific skill for that day, and we would be put to work. Now, that means making sure our tents are organized, that the campgrounds are clean and orderly, and then we would learn different skills such as uh, nursing, how to care for the sick, of, of course, uh, how to start your own campfire safely, how to leave a campground safely, all sorts of things, as well as nature walks. And one of my good friends, Mr. Walter Hoxie, was what we call a naturalist. And he was ever so kind to come and teach my girls and take them on nature walks, as he was an expert in nature in identifying plants and animals, especially those that were we could forage we would even forage out in the forest certain berries certain mushrooms we'd go fishing for our food so at camp lowlands i do believe that that's the that will encourage more girl scout camps to be formed and i like the sound of camp juliet low <laughs> so i do hope that will come to fruition <laughs> thank you for your question arabella's mom was wondering if you could tell us about how many flowers you have Oh, goodness, Arabella, have you been to my house at Wellsburn? <laughs> I am very fond of, of nature, of course, and all its beauty, but flowers, of course, have uh, such, such an art to them, don't they? You just want to paint them. And I had a very beautiful garden at Wellsburn House, and we even had a greenhouse there, so I was able, able to cultivate plants and flowers of my own that might not be suitable for the climate outside. So you are correct, and, and in part, one of my, my, of course, my love for nature also shows itself in Girl Scouting as many troops decide on a flower as their troop name. And in fact, if we have any troops today that have followed this tradition, I would love to know what flower your troop chose. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Hillary was wondering, can you tell us about the original Girl Scout handbook? And she has one from 1933. Ah, oh, so our, our Girl Scout handbook. Well, the first one was uh, very, quite shorter than our newest edition. We actually, here in 1920, just came out with a new edition that I'm very proud of and we've worked very hard on to expand and be more thorough with our skills and directions. But in, in 1912, we had our Girl Guides manual, and of course, that was largely based on the Girl Guides of England. In 1915, when we had our Girl Scouts officially, we had a new manual, and that further expanded. Now, the basic skills that we taught 
for, of course, the Girl Scout uh, codes and laws. So, a Girl Scout and, uh, of course, our promise. So, as I'm sure all of you already know, but we have the Girl Scout promise, we have a Girl Scout motto, we have our Girl Scout uh, motto to be prepared, and, of course, when a Girl Scout uh, takes the Girl Scout promise. It's very important. So there were instructions on how to host the ceremony. And they would learn the laws and have to abide by each of those laws. So the first manual was largely about how to learn those skills. Uh, a Girl Scout's honor is to be trusted. A Girl Scout is to be loyal. A Girl Scout's duty is to be useful and help others. A Girl Scout is a friend to all and a sister to every other Girl Scout. A Girl Scout is cur cur courteous and curious, but courteous. A Girl Scout is a friend to animals. A Girl Scout obeys orders. And these laws show themselves in various ways. So to be kind to others and to nature, that has much to do with the skills that we learned about nursing the sick and helping those who didn't know how to... Uh, how to create their own food through gardening and uh, thrift ways such as uh, preserving food for much longer but it was also being a good and kind citizen so these laws showed themselves in the basic skills that we first taught our girls but this 1920 edition that's just come out is very thorough and i encourage all of you to take a look at it we even have illustrations in this one which i'm very excited about as that's a new edition for us so it's very thorough, much easier to understand, and I've had quite a lot of help writing this latest edition. If you go back to my 1912 <laughs> version, you may see that it, it's very much in my voice. It's very much uh, the way that I, I speak almost, and that can be a bit confusing sometimes. So I have uh, trusted my editors and my writers to help me with this latest edition to be very clear, very thorough, and expand on our skill sets. A very curious question, and I, I do encourage all of you to take a look at our latest 1920 Girl Scouts manual. One of our viewers was wondering, did you know Amelia Earhart? Amelia Earhart. Now that does not ring a bell. Now, uh, perhaps you could tell me a little bit about her, and maybe I can uh, ex explain <laughs> further, but I don't think I know an Amelia Earhart. Julia was wondering, did you have any other nieces besides Daisy that joined the Girl Scouts? Oh, yes. Well, I have quite a large family. Now, of course, I have f five siblings. I have uh, two older... Well, there was Eleanor, who was the oldest, and then there was me. And then there was Alice, who, oh, dear Alice, she passed away at 17 due to scarlet fever, and it was quite a tragedy. And then there's Mabel, my youngest sister. Then there's Arthur and Bill. And they do have children, but it's the girls, uh, Caroline and Daisy, Daisy Dukes, that have become the most involved in Girl Scouting, particularly Daisy as a... Uh, she, I think she likes to take after me as we are. Uh, we share the same name, we share the same interests. I see a lot of myself in young Daisy. And so she's been a very good scout. Karen was wondering, when you started the scouts, did you realize how big that this was going to get and how it was going to flourish and endure? Oh, goodness. And it was Caroline? Oh, that's Karen. Karen. <laughs> Karen, I had no idea. All I knew is that I wanted to do everything that I could to share Girl Scouting with the nation, with the entire world. Scouting was something that no matter what social class you were from, you were on an even plane when you were a Girl Scout because all Girl Scouts are equal. And so, as we did quickly grow, I knew that this was something big and it was so exciting. It was also a bit scary, which is why I needed the help of other women and men along the way. So much of my work in the early days was to recruit and to uh, promote Girl Scouts. 
So I would go, I would use all my social connections. Now I was very fortunate to have those social connections as my husband was of a higher social class and my family was also very well known and my mother's side of the family was also very well known as they helped found the city of Chicago. So I used my connections to spread the word. And as we grew and grew, there were some very clever ideas and using new technologies, especially. Why, just recently, I believe it was only two years ago now, we made our own moving picture called the Golden Eaglet. And this was shown in movie theaters. And it was so exciting to see our scouts on this big screen and showing people just what it is to be a scout. Now, if you have an opportunity to watch the Golden Eaglet, I highly recommend that you do. And you can see our early scouts in action. I thank you for your question. I hope I answered it. I've, I've gotten a bit scatterbrained all of a sudden. <laughs> Hilda was wondering, what helped you overcome these obstacles and people who told you no, that this couldn't be done? Well, the people who told me no, I have to admit, uh, they, they had a reason. And that reason was, especially my family, I should say. Now, they supported me, of course, but they had their uh, doubts in the beginning as... I had always been one to go from one fascination quickly to another. In fact, growing up, my name, my nickname was either Crazy Daisy or Hurricane Daisy because you just never know what I was going to be fascinated with next. So when I told my mother and my father about my fascination with girl guiding and girl scouting, they had their skepticism. <laughs> but in the end, they supported me wholeheartedly. Now, those who saw controversy in what we were doing, well, I tried to make peace with them, but it, you, you just have to accept that some people are not going to see uh, what's this opportunity the way that you do. Um, one of those people was actually a leader of another a fine organization called uh, the Campfire Girls. Now, the Campfire Girls were also a social uh, organization for young girls, and they learned similar skills to what we did, but most of it was focused on more domestic skills, um, how to be, uh, uh, how to care for children, uh, how to cook, how to clean properly, homemaking skills, and these are all extremely important, and indeed, uh, our scouts do learn these skills as well, but I felt that it was simply limiting to the young girls there, and... The uh, leader of the organization, James West, and I did not agree on that. I offered an invitation to the Campfire Girls to join Girl Scouts, but they, James, declined. And I was sad about that, but I felt that, especially during the Great War, uh, this was quite recent for me, only a few years ago, I felt that most recently we have truly proven ourselves as Girl Scouts and have been recognized on a national stage. And though I haven't heard from Mr. West in quite some time, I do wonder from time to time if he has changed his mind now. I do feel that we are changing the perspectives of those who feel that girls shouldn't be learning these skills or pursuing career paths outside the home, but we must persevere. We cannot mind that, and there are plenty of those who support us, and those are the people that I would rather concern myself with than those who do not agree with us. I thank you for your question, a very good question. Now, I believe we might have time for uh, perhaps a few more questions. If well, we, have we them. just have one more question, oh, so it's perfect timing. Karen was wondering, what did the original scouts do upon completion of their service? Were there any projects or special ceremonies that they, they did? Oh, yes. Now, we did have wonderful ceremonies. And we would uh, gather the Girl Scouts. And, of course, the certain there were certain badges that you could earn. Now, there were merit badges, of course, that could be earned. There were second-class badges sort of in between. And then there was the first-class badge. And all of these uh, ceremonies depended on the amount of skills that the girls learned. Now, for our highest honor, the Golden Eaglet, you had to complete 15. 
keen skills. And that took quite some time. So it was a very joyous occasion when our Girl Scouts would make those achievements, uh, whether it was a merit badge earning a certain group of skills or that second class badge when you're on your way to your first class and even the golden eaglet. And the ceremonies would indeed uh, be uh, what you would expect. We would, uh, we would have our tea set out. We would gather round. We would say a special thanks to the girls and speak on behalf of the girls. We would uh, reavow our promise, our Girl Scout promise. And we would simply, uh, after the ceremony was completed and they had earned their badges, we would uh, socialize and simply celebrate among all of our Girl Scouts. And I do believe that those ceremonies are such wonderful memories for a Scout to earn that skill and to be uh, honored for it is very special. And it's, it's not in a, a braggadocious way in, in, in any way. It's, it's meant to encourage the other girls to see that it can be done. If you put the work in, then you will uh, earn your badge. You will earn the honor and earn that ceremony. So very special. We would sing songs as well during our ceremonies. And those are some of the most special memories, to see the smiles on those girls' faces as they truly knew that they had earned that skill, earned that badge, and earned all of the celebration around them. And I believe that's an excellent uh, time to end as I do have to go to another Girl Scout meeting and I am known for being late. Now, I appreciate all of you coming to my house today to meet me and learn even more about the Girl Scouts. And if you are a Scout or not, I encourage you to learn about the Scout ways. For even if you earn a badge for it or not, all of these skills are valuable and worth sharing. Thank you so much, and I do appreciate all of you for being here today. Take care. Mm -hmm.